A concept I only talk about periodically because it only comes up periodically is the concept of a first game. Um, <clears throat> which is a terrible terminology, but whatever. That's English for you. A first game is, of course, uh, a developer's first real attempt or work into either a series or a genre. You know, trying out something, right? And it's obvious to point to most first games because most of them came out in the early 80s. There are exceptions, of course. <laughs> but I bring this up because most first games kind of suck. I don't really mean that as an insult. It's just a statement of fact. Most first games, they're getting used to things. They're trying out things for the first time, and they're making do with what they have. Super Mario Bros. 1 isn't a bad game, but it's only barely net positive. Zelda 1, I imagine, we're not there yet, will eventually review kind of poorly. Um, if you look back at Warcraft 1, that game you know, is, is pretty bad, and so forth and so on. You get the idea, right? Obviously, there's some variability to this, because now <laughs> nowadays, first games are kind of different, thanks to how gaming is. Most first games only go back as far as about the PS2 or PS3, uh, in terms of recent ability. It's a new word, you can use it. But the reason I bring all this up is, I feel like this is the best first game we've covered on this show. Unless you count Portal, which I don't. I, 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 two games does not constitute a series, I'm sorry. <laughs> But God of Wars, the God of Wars in general, counting the PSP games and the, the, the trilogy and then four, have always been decently quality. And in hindsight, it makes perfect sense why. Because I sort of always had this mental impression that God of War 1 came out right about the same time Devil May Cry 1 did, and have compared the two in my mind ever since. The thing is, it didn't. God of War 1 came out closer to Devil May Cry 3 than 1. And that by itself says all it needs to. This is the other caveat. If you're walking into your first game, but other people have already made the mistakes and already you know, gotten past most of the problems of early game design in a particular genre, then you can learn from them. You can build upon them and, and grow and learn and be like, aha, this worked, but this didn't, and so forth and so on. This is one of the reasons why the very concept of first games isn't really a thing in the modern era. So, okay, cool. But then I still remember this game not being super great. And as I was going through it, it was better than I thought it was going to be, but at the same time, worse. In two different directions. I'm just going to say the comparison directly. This game reminds me a lot of Grand Theft Auto. How many Grand Theft Auto games have there been? I'm just going to give you a hint. It's essentially all of them, all but one of them, really, have, have been generally enjoyable, except there's occasional moments or missions which are just absolutely frustrating, where you're just sitting there going, oh, God, just trying to rip your teeth out because of how much it's pissing you off trying to get through a specific section. I bet most of you can think of such sections right now off the top of your head, not just in the GTAs, but in this game. God of War 1 is actually a surprisingly decent game, except for when it's extremely frustrating. And that's why it actually scored as well as it did. I'll go ahead and tell you it was a 20 point something in terms of the golden number, which isn't exactly a high number in the grand scheme of things, and I admit that. It's not even what I would call a normally decent game, but it is net positive, and it's more net positive than most of the other first games we've covered. I think this is why, because they actually managed to do a decent combat engine with surprisingly good enemy variety and surprisingly good uh, encounter design in which enemies they throw at you at what times. Now, you notice I'm not mentioning the puzzles. That's because most of the puzzles are not really all that stand out. They're decent, uh, except when they're frustrating. But for the most part, they're just, okay, this is neat. Uh, figure this out. You know, put a few Tetris blocks together. That's cool. That's cool. I'm with it. I'm with it, you know. And then there's the spiked block puzzle. <sighs> and then there's the shove the box up the hill while b blocking enemies are nonstop respawning on your face puzzle. Or the shove the box to the end of the, the boat while archers are shooting you and breaking the box puzzle. And so forth and so on. You get my point. There's irritations and frustrations. And then there's Hades. I could go through the specifics and details of some of the gameplay aspects. I do firmly consider this to be a beat-em-up, and that's something I do want to talk about. I talked about the string stream, but of course, these are stream summaries, so that's kind of the point. Beat-em-ups, uh, let, let me clarify what I mean when I say beat-em-up. Uh, what, what my mind goes to when I think of the beat-em-up genre is, you know, Fatal Fury or Double Dragon 
or River City Ransom. In the modern era, those are expressed in a slightly more three-dimensional format, but the core concepts remain the same in games like Devil May Cry, um, God of War, and Yakuza is another common modern beat-em-up. You're moving around, you've got a, you know, a mo move sets that allow you to progress through it, uh, enemy encounters at enemy variety, you know, attack you in waves, sometimes you can't progress to the right, that is to say forwards, until you beat a certain number of enemies. All this stuff is, you know, fairly standard beat-em-up stuff, but the thing that really makes a beat-em-up a beat-em-up is the core nature of how the player interacts with the enemies. I know that sounds stupid, so I'm going to try and explain this. We talked about this on stream as well. Beat-em-ups are designed around you being clever about how you attack them. You can't just mash attack. It will not work. This goes all the way back to the arcade era, and, of course, the old NES era as well. Even way, way, way back then, 30 excuse me, 40 years ago now, uh, they had already figured out how to prevent the player from just mashing A and pushing through the fight. So we have concepts where, uh, I actually don't know the official terms, please forgive me, but there's staggering, you know, there's, so there's actually juggling, hyper-juggling, armor, and hyper-armor. That's how I'm going to call them, okay? So juggling is obvious. Wham, wham, wham. We'll use God of War 1 as an example. You're swinging the blades, shung, 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 and the enemy's going, uh, 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 uh. That's juggling, okay? Now, almost every enemy in the game has an ability to break out of juggle. This is almost always due to them being juggled X amount of times. That's their armor. Now, conversely, or inversely? Perversely? <laughs> Weirdly enough, the way armor works is kind of the inverse of what you'd think. Armor fills. As they take hits, their armor bar fills up. Once it fills up, they stop being juggled. Make sense? So, you know, you, you've seen this. If, even if you haven't really processed this, you've seen this if you've played this game where you're like, Kong, Kong, Kong. And then they just kind of get up and smack you in the face, even though you're still attacking them. It's because their armor has kicked in, and now they're resisting being juggled. Again, this goes all the way back to the old style, too, but this is a critical component of a beat-em-up because you need to decide how you're attacking, why, and where. Now, more modern beat-em-ups, like Yakuza, but also, most especially, Devil May Cry, Bayonetta, and God of War, the three big ones, I would say, have started going into a subgenre of beat-em-up, which I like to call spectacle fighters. I wish I came up with that term, but I didn't. I got that one from Yahtzee Croshaw. Anyways... Spectacle fighters uh, reward you for actually being as unique or fun or interesting in how you bypass the armor mechanic and how you juggle them by varying up your moves or varying up your specials or whatever, right? But God of War 1 isn't really fully spectacle yet. We're not there yet. This is still pretty classic beat-em-up. Now, I haven't explained the other two things, so I mentioned... Um, juggling, there's also hyper-juggling. It's really easy to see hyper-juggling because whatever they're doing is instantly canceled and they actually flop on the ground whenever you hyper-juggle them, right? And you and again, picture it in your head. You know what I'm talking about because they're like, shh, shh, shh. And they go, oh, pong, 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 pong. That's a hyper-juggle, a complete cancel of everything they're doing and an effective stun for several seconds before they can actually take action again. Now, some enemies, in, uh, especially in the later God of Wars, actually have hyper-juggle resistance, but that gets into hyper-armor. Hyper-armor is exactly what it sounds like. It's something that it, it takes into account completely regardless of juggling and also resists hyper-juggling. Make sense? Now, this is all relatively simple stuff, but the way in which your attacks and moves, juggling, armor, hyper-armor, and hyper-juggling, all of this, the way it coordinates and interacts with each other, is what makes a beat-em-up a beat-em-up. This is core central mechanics right here. It's the jump button and the pickup button of Super Mario Brothers 2. That's why I wanted to really sit and talk about that for a moment and explain why I consider this as such. Now, they do a pretty good job with it in this one. There are only a couple of uh, exceptions, really, like, I think actually two, where it felt like the enemies were frustrating as opposed to interesting. And speaking as someone who's actually beaten this game on God difficulty... Uh, this game can get very, very irritating. Cough, cough, Medusas. I also, if I might be so bold, while the core combat controls control very well, I personally don't like dodge being on the right stick. I know why they did it. It makes sense. Uh, I was talking about this on stream, too. I'm going to just keep saying this. I talked about this on stream. Just, just put up like a little sign, you know, just, just attach some poster tape to this and just kind of have this up and just kind of do this periodically. One of the things that they, they do is they do a trade-off with regards to the dodge roll. So in most games, it would be one of the shoulder buttons, because that way you can hit it while doing whatever you're doing with the face buttons with your thumbs, right? 
but instead they put it on the right stick, which means you have to move your thumb off of the face buttons to do that, which means not only is there a slight delay involved, but you cannot be doing any other action while you're doing it. You have to effectively stop using the right face buttons in order to dodge. That's the trade-off. The thing you get back from that is you can dodge roll in any direction because you can flick the stick in whatever direction you want to dodge roll in, and that actually gives you more control over it. Most games would do a thing where you'd have to hold uh, the left stick, the movement stick, in a direction and then hit R1, for example, and then you dodge in that direction. So whether that's better or worse is up to you. I actually don't care for it personally and kind of stopped dodging except for certain circumstances as a direct consequence. Shrug. I'll also say that the blocking is weird in this one. We'll be blocking a lot more in God of War 2. <laughs> Someone who shall not be named, and is almost assuredly not watching this video, kept accusing me of not blocking, and that's actually wrong. Uh, I was using the block button quite often. The problem is the block button is interesting. You have to have started the blocking act action before the attack hits, which is a standard block, or you have to hit it at the right time when the attack hits, which is a perfect block, or a parry, in simple terms. So if you screw up that timing because you're terrible... Instead, it just looks like you're not blocking, but I was trying to block quite a bit, especially since parrying is such a very valid target uh, move in this game. It actually very much rewards you, almost across the board, for parrying. Um, I sort of mentally started shifting myself into Jedi Fallen Order mentality, which is a game I played on hard, because I really enjoyed the parry mechanic of that game. But I'm just terrible, apparently. Either way... Going through it, you know, it's like, okay, parry, block, dodge, attacks, moves. Let me take a moment to praise the Blades of Chaos. They're one of the most well-designed weapons I've seen in a game like this, and I mean that. Oh, don't mistake me. There's other fun, interesting weapons in, you know, in The Devil May Cries and in the future God of Wars that are more interesting or more engaging in one way. But in terms of core design, the Blades of Chaos are your shotgun. Now... <laughs> I, I need to explain that. Most of you probably haven't seen my Halo videos or my Halo streams, but one of the things I praised was the simplicity and yet clear, careful design that was put into the weapons in Halo 1 specifically, especially the shotgun. And that's the Blades of Chaos. They're not fancy, they're just good. Very clear thought is put into what they can attack, when, how often, and uh, what reach, and what range. So... You have your sweeping attacks, some of which are combos, some of which you can only activate after a certain number of attacks. Some of them are the, the straight down forward. Some of them uh, go straight directly in front of you. Some of them hit right in front of you. Some of them have an AoE effect right in front of you. If you were to paint the terrain that you can attack with the Blades of Chaos, it's effectively a gigantic sphere that goes around you in all directions, but not with one attack. And that's what makes them so well-designed and so brilliant you really are rewarded for sitting down and thinking about which attacks do what and when. Because you can't start with this attack, that's the third attack in the combo. But what if you don't want to waste the first two attacks on an enemy that's currently blocking, for, for example? Or you don't want to reposition yourself while that's happening. Well, you can attack in this way or this way, and then turn this way and actually go ahead and do the thing, because one of the things that the game does do well in terms of its combat controls is how well, how much control you have over where you're facing, even during a swing. You can be winding up, and you can spin a huge amount, I think it's actually a full 90 degrees, uh, before you actually land the attack, which gives you a huge amount of reaction time, which is extremely important for a game like this. Because you need to be reacting in milliseconds, not seconds. And that allows you to adjust your attacks like that. Which is very helpful, very important, and also ties in neatly with how the, the, the system combos with itself. Um, you know, the, the square, hold down, square, 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 triangle, square, 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 triangle, L1 triangle, L1 square, etc., etc. There's tons of different moves and attacks, and it's all based on the same core weapon, and it's awesome. The other weapons are good. Blade of Artemis is an interesting trade-off. You start off with all the moves, but it doesn't. it's not really worthwhile until you've fully upgraded it. But, once you've fully upgraded it, it's a chipper shredder, and will absolutely destroy whatever's in your way. The biggest and most obvious trade-off is range and reach. Its attacks are actually relatively simple. They tend to hit around you, usually just a little bit above or below around you, because it's a lot of the um, the diagonal slice type of attacks. But otherwise, that's it. That's, that's the Blades of Artemis. You also get some spells along the way. The Zeus's Lightning, which is basically just there to be a ranged attack, but has its own uses. The Medusa's Ray, which is extremely useful on some enemies and not on others, so that's a bit situational, but very good when it's there. 
Poseidon's Wrath, because for some reason Poseidon is lightning. It's, I, I don't know, don't ask me. Um, <laughs> that's useful, though. It's it's kind of the stop bothering me button. And it's a, it, it, and it, it also ties into the big thing that magic is in this game, which is bypassing combat. Everything I talked about earlier with regards to you know juggling and, and armor and all that stuff, None of that really applies with magic. That's the point. This is another way. This is a beat 'em up. A lot of old beat 'em ups, um, like the Golden Axe series, for example, usually had a "oh screw you" button. Uh, X Men on the arcade had a similar thing too. It's your special, right? And that's called that for a reason. Most of the time in the arcade games, it would actually drain your health to use it. Here, it drains your mana, and you really don't have that much mana to burn. So you only get a few shots of these things. But when you do, whatever's in your way dies. It is a great way to, uh, for example, reset the board. Let's say you're surrounded by a bunch of enemies. That's causing you issues. Pop up Poseidon's Wrath. And you may not kill them, but you will reset all of them. All of them are, are basically just chonked back down to zero. Plopped down on the floor. And now you can start the fight fresh without being surrounded and juggled yourself. Because you don't really have juggle armor. So, all sorts of cool stuff like that. But, of course, the best spell is the armor. Uh, the Excuse me, the army of Hades. Which... Just, it, it's, it's the, it's the die button. It's the die button. Here, I'm gonna summon a bunch of souls which will home in perfectly and quickly and just rapid fire attack everything in the area. And the higher you level it, the more souls they are doing more damage to more things. That's the street sweeper right there. It's almost required on hard difficulty for the second phase of the final boss fight. Which is another thing that weirds me out about this game. I mentioned this is a first game. And a lot of things first games tend to be uh, to have in commonality with each other is what TV Tropes refers to as early installment weirdness, where it doesn't really fit with the rest of the franchise, either in terms of gameplay, story, theme, tone, uh, or any combination thereof. And I think this one applies universally. While they certainly talked about wanting to do a sequel to God of War 1 and left multiple plot threads to carry up on in the future, some of which they actually did, for the most part, this game doesn't really fit with the future games in multiple key ways, especially on the gameplay axis, but especially, especially on the story axis. But bosses is one of the big ones. How many bosses do you think are in this game? Go ahead and pause and answer if you want to. I'll give you a second. Three. There's the, uh, the Hydra, there's the Minotaur, and there's Ares. That's it. How many bosses do you think are in God of War 2? 14. And that's sort of my point. This series would actually become known for its boss fights, and um, not until the second game came out, essentially. Again, fairly common thing, right? You know, Mega Man 1. But I suppose it's time to talk about the story, but believe it or not, as is common for games like this, I have the least to say about the story of this game. It's So, spoilers, spoiler warning, as usual. It's, I, I want to call it a, clip, a typical Greek tragedy, but I don't know how accurate that is, and I don't want people to jump over me for definitions. So all I'll say is it's a good classical tragedy story, regardless of whether it's Greek or not. You have Kratos, who is not a good person, who we learn more about him as we go throughout the game. We don't even get the final backstory about him until, like, the last, uh, excuse me, right before the last stage. So, right before you go to Hades he's not a good person. He goes around, he kills people en masse, but then he made a bargain with a god. This was a terrible idea, as it always is. So, especially with the Greek deities who are assholes. I'm going to pause for a moment to talk about that first. So, the Greek pantheon are, of course, all evil, horrible people, right? Eh, debatable. There's, there's some malleable uh, malleability in terms of interpretation there. But Ares is obviously an overtly evil. Which is funny, because I would consider him to be the second most evil deity in this game in particular, after Athena. Athena bothers me for the same reason that slimy lawyers bother me. Nothing they're doing is wrong, technically. In fact, characters like Athena are why the term technically actually exists at all. Where they're not actually lying to Kratos, they're just deceiving him. Athena never mentions why her city is under attack never explains why Kratos is being tasked with dealing with Ares, dangles Ares in front of him knowing that he's got a grudge against Ares, 
In short, she manipulates him expertly and quietly behind the background. I mean, not that it's hard to manipulate someone like Kratos, but you get my point, right? So she's just, yeah, okay, go do this and this. Figure this out. It'll be okay. Make this happen. Do what you got to do. Oh, and we'll totally forgive you if you do. Keeping in mind, Kratos didn't ask for forgiveness. He asked for the nightmares to stop. He asked for all this pain and horror that he has been suffering, the post-traumatic stress, if you will, to go away. So she says, yeah, no, we'll totally, we, we got you, no problem. And all of this is just because of a, a sibling spat. The fact that Ares is pissed that Zeus happens to be favoring Athena lately. But that's so in character. That's so appropriate, isn't it? Kratos is literally just another pawn on the board of the deities who are bored. Doing whatever they want to and however they want to. Because who cares about the pieces? You should be honored to be a piece for us. Nowhere is this more obvious than the story of, I can't remember his name. I'll actually look it up because I wrote him down in the review document over here. I give him a plus for this. Pathos Virtus III, or however you pronounce that. He is the architect who built the Temple of Pandora and lost his family, his love, and his life in the doing. As you go through reading his things, it starts off, loyal servant of the gods, and then it stops. He stops adding that. And then he says, once faithful servant of the gods. And bit by bit, you see how his faith was diminished. Of course, none of the deities give a crap about him. No one venerates him. No one cares about him. He did what he was supposed to do. He should be honored to be a pawn of the gods. And that's exactly the attitude, consistently, persistently throughout. Kratos is a favored pawn, because the Zeus connection was even here. But that's it. He's just another toy. Even when he, at the end, does not receive the removal of his trauma that he was seeking, he, doesn't, he isn't allowed to do the only thing he wants to do, which is to die and be done with it. Instead, he is forced to become the new god of war, which is probably just Athena playing at power games again, especially given future entries, which I will not spoil here. Yeah. And that's the plot in a nutshell. And that, that's, that's why I always said this is going to be kind of a short video, because there's not much to talk about on the story axis, even though the story scored better than the gameplay. It's because there's less story there. So what story is there is actually pretty good, all things considered. I'm a little impressed by how well constructed it is. It has its issues, don't mistake me, especially toward the end of the game. <laughs> and it fails at several aspects of presentation. You know, the voice acting isn't great, the animations aren't good, the cinematics aren't good. But the core elements, the core meat of the story is actually surprisingly interesting and engages me more than I thought I would. It absolutely puts me in the shoes of Kratos, too, because screw these guys! Can we just kill them all? Well, we'll find out the answer to that in the second game, which we will be playing later today. A game I anticipate will score substantially higher than a 20. I hope you've enjoyed as always. I'll see you next time.